Not so long ago, the type of bike you'd be riding would pretty much define what you wore on the bike. Like if you're riding a downhill bike, you're gonna be wearing a downhill full face helmet, probably some goggles and some body armor as well. Likewise, if you're riding the opposite, like a cross country bike or a trail bike, you're pretty much gonna be wearing an open face helmet and much less gear. However, with the advent of enduro racing, and of course, as bike parks have become more popular, along with shuttle based riding, a full face helmet has suddenly become a lot more applicable to many more mountain bikers, especially when you ride as fast as this. have sent me their brand new Defender helmet and they also invited me to their test facility and their production line out in Italy so I can show you exactly what goes into making a helmet and making it as strong and light as possible. That's especially important considering how modern mountain bikes can be ridden. Now through the video I'm going to use this helmet to show you just how tough a modern mountain bike helmet is what it has to go through to pass those safety standards, and more importantly, to give you ultimate protection. A lot of people ask about the standards the helmets have to pass. There's only one mandatory standard for mountain bike helmets to pass, that's the EN 1078. Now, all helmets suitable for cycling and mountain biking have to pass this standard. So if there's a shop that sells a helmet, you're buying it, it's past it, you should be safe on that front. And that standard directly applies to everything tested above this line. There's also another standard, the ASTM standard, which is the American standard. That is specific to the jaw guard or the chin guard, chin piece on a helmet. Now that is if a helmet is downhill certified and it has one of these on, you'll be looking for that in addition. These helmets meet both of those. And the bit you've actually been coming here to watch is how are helmets made? Check this out. Another common question is what are helmets made from and why? Well, in this case, the outer shell is made from carbon fiber for two reasons. Firstly, it's very, very light. And secondly, it's very strong. And of course, that is the remit for this helmet. It's supposed to be ventilated, very light and very protective. As far as the inside go, it's all about the EPS liner. So this is expanded polystyrene, and this has a single job to do, and that is to crush on impact. It slows down those G-forces that your head goes through in an impact, and it absorbs that. That is why it's so important if you drop your helmet, you need to get it checked, because if any part of the EPS liner is split or cracks, it's not gonna be able to do that crushing job properly. It's a safety aspect. Now, in the case of these helmets, they actually have two different sizes of these liners with two different shell sizes, which in the combination of all the different sort of cheek pads and stuff that go in, form the different size total helmets you can buy. As you can see, if I just offer these up here, you can actually pretty much build the shape of the helmet just by using that EPS system on the inside. It's a really cool system. And in case you wondered how many components there are in a full face helmet, so this is the cast defender. And I count here about 35 individual components. Cast helmets are entirely manufactured in Italy. Uh, this is the room in fact where they're all assembled. It actually takes place entirely by hand, which is quite cool and I think quite rare as well. And it's obviously because of the fact there's a lot of delicate components and some of this stuff just can't be automated. We're talking about stuff like the hardware has to be riveted in place and this is using repetitive machines that have to be done by hand. So the first part of the process is the hardware goes into the helmet. You're talking about the chin strap here. You're talking about the peak mounts, all that sort of stuff. And then the next part of that process will be all of that rubber edging going in place. So you're talking about the mesh that goes here to stop the flies coming in through the vents at the front of the helmet there. And then of course that nice rubber edging and the goggle grip that goes around the side of the helmet there. Once that is done and that's all in place securely, it's down to the EPS liner. Now this is the really cool part of the process because it's actually a five part design. Now this is something I've not actually seen before in the flesh. 
and I have a two-part main piece of the helmet that sits on the inside and that's a compression fit directly into the shell. And then the jaw guard pieces, there's actually three of them and these are bonded in place into the jaw guard here. Now this is the time part of the process because it takes between two and three hours for a helmet to be completely finished and that is because this piece has to cure to be completely set and be as strong as it needs to be to pass all those important standards. Finally, you're talking about things like the, the vent goes on the front here with the mesh there, the air filter. And then of course you have the actual padding goes inside. Now, as you can also see on these inside EPS parts, there's no Velcro involved. They have a button in system for that liner. Really cool, really comfortable, really easy to remove and wash. And then of course you have the cheek guards or the cheek pads go. And they also have that safety feature that enables them to be ripped out. Now, what exactly goes into the testing of helmets? Well, I actually went over to Italy recently to check that out. Okay, so we're here in Italy, in Milan, at the safety testing facility used by Cask. Now, this place specializes in testing and certifying all sorts of safety equipment, including, of course, helmets. Now, at this facility, they test anything from Formula One helmets to ice skating and skiing, and of course, mountain bike equipment. Now, around the building and the facility here, there are all sorts of different dummy heads, and they're all used for different purposes. This one here isn't for impact testing. This is actually for a motorcycle helmet fit. Now, you see it's got this red profile on the back here. When the helmet's in place, if you can see the red, that's a fail straight out. But interestingly, is actually the weight of the heads that are used inside. This is to replicate a real human skull, and they're quite a lot heavier than I actually realized. So a size extra large helmet, i.e. a size extra large head like mine, that can weigh 6.1 kilograms. That is seriously heavy. But come and check this out. They've got some really interesting equipment over here. Now we're gonna see a range of different tests today that mountain bike helmets, in particular, full face downhill certified helmets have to go through. And some of them are really quite brutal. They'll be using things that weigh an extremely heavy amount, really. So this is a flat plate test. There's also a separate one to replicate what a curbstone would do in a direct impact. We're gonna see this in use. I think it's fascinating that there's so much different stuff here. And it all, of course, has to adhere to certain types of standard. So today, we are checking out the brand new Cask Defender helmet. Of course, this is just a test mule that has already been tested, but we're gonna take you through all of the tests that this has to go through to meet downhill certification. Now, as you might imagine, the testing process is very strict. Now, the testing formula is built up of various different safety standards, and of course, this is based on medical research as well as the actual fabrication of all this stuff. Now, the first part of the process is happening right here. So the helmet comes in, it goes onto this machine, and essentially, they're testing the geometry of the helmet for where they need to test. This will be different on different size helmets. So this one, for example, might be a size medium. The mule on the inside will be a medium. The helmet correlates to that. It has to fit to be correct. They'll use this to test the field of vision, basically. This will sit at the top of the helmet here, and this will meet with the jaw guard. That is to ensure that the helmet is the correct fit, and the opening, basically, is in the correct place there. Then I use a series of lasers here and I calibrate this in different positions to simulate riding head down, riding head up, side to side. And they basically come up with this line here that you can just about see. Now this line essentially is where the helmet needs to be tested above to pass a bicycle certification. That's the European standard. Anything below this would qualify as a downer certified helmet, but that's a whole different thing that we're gonna get into a bit later in the video. So the process goes like this. You have part one, which is getting the geometry tested on the helmet. This is where the test zones are laid out and it will be different on each size and style of helmet. Next up is the roll off test. And basically they put a helmet on an actual mule and have to try and rip it off the mule. This is to test the strap on there. Then it is to the all out impact testing. Basically that's the test for destruction to see what it actually does when you put it through its paces. And then finally there's a retention strength to see how strong the strap is and make sure it's doing its job. It's pretty vigorous. And then within that, there are a bunch of different parameters and we'll deal with those as we move around. Okay, so this is the roll off part of the test. Essentially, this is to make sure the helmet stays on your head. We've all been in one of those crashes before we are tumbling around, you get hooked up on stuff. If your helmet comes off, it's not gonna do its job. So I have a 10 kilo weight here suspended on this big hook, and they drop this to try and rip the helmet straight off the dummy head here. Again, pretty brutal test, but absolutely necessary. If it doesn't get past this, it goes no further. That will be a fail. 
Now the retention or the strap system on a helmet is crucial, A, in how comfortable it is, and B, of course, in keeping the helmet on your head. Now there's no certification for the style of strap you have to use. It's up to you as a manufacturer. If you want to use a buckle system or if you want to use something a bit more traditional, like the motorcycle style double D system here. Now, I actually prefer these myself because I know the fact that safety services and medical services all around the world are really familiar with these. And I think that is probably why Cask have chosen that. However, there is a thickness of the pad that you do need to adhere to. It needs to be 15 millimeters minimum. That's of course to spread the load out so you're not, it doesn't cut into your neck. They've actually gone for 20 millimeters, so that does make it a bit more comfortable. As far as the test for this goes, the retention system, they test it on a mule like this. So again, it's tested per helmet size. So the same test is repeated for every size of helmet with the relevant size head mule on the inside. Now under here, you might not be able to see it. There's an artificial jaw and they secure the helmet to this. They've got weights here that's four kilograms and they drop it from a height of 60 centimeters. And then they test it with a machine over there that basically measure the deflection in millimeters to certify whether it's a pass or a fail. And that essentially is what keeps the helmet on your head. They're testing for the mounting points, and they're testing for how strong and durable it is. If it passes, you have a very safe helmet. Okay, so this is the ultimate impact test. Now this is serious business. Each helmet has to withstand three different impacts. Now it can be two with other testing facilities and other manufacturers, but they like to exceed here. They like to make sure they're as strong as possible. Now it could be tested on the side, it could be tested on the top, it could be tested on the back, or more importantly on the vents to test the structure. But each individual helmet has to have three strikes here. Now also, every size is tested in the same way and each of those helmets has different variables. There'll be a standard one, there'll be a hot one, there'll be a cold one, and there'll also be one that simulates aging process like UV. So they really are tested to exceed every possible eventuality. As for the actual destruction, there's two different styles of the test. There's the flat piece and there's one to simulate hitting a curbstone. For the curbstone, it's like hitting a curb at 16.4 kilometers an hour. And as for the flat one, which we're gonna see in a minute, that's about 19 and a half kilometers an hour. So you imagine hitting your head on something like that at that speed, that is a serious impact. And these helmets, well, they laugh it off. As you can see, it's quite a brutal test. That was just one strike. So that helmet has to do two more of those. And something I didn't say earlier is really important to say is per size of helmet, there'll be the appropriate weight head inside. So if you're testing an XL, it's gonna have a 6.2 or 6.1 kilo head, something like mine inside it. That has a serious amount of weight and that has a serious impact. Now, in addition to the impact testing that's, well, frankly, quite brutal, they also need to test some very specific components on the helmet. So I'm just gonna put this aside and show you what is actually a more productionized helmet with a peak on here. You've obviously got the peak mount. Now this actually has a screw that goes into the helmet. So they will test the impact with the peak in place and sometimes without it in place to test what happens to the inside of the helmet there. Of course, if there's any sort of screw or any sort of hardware on your helmet, you do not want that to penetrate your head in the event of an impact. So that is the test that's gonna happen in a minute. And we're also gonna see what happens when the peak is struck itself. Obviously you want the peak to sort of deflect and not impact on what the actual helmet does to your head. It's quite important stuff because you imagine if you had a peak that didn't move, you could force your head back, you could do any number of things. Very important part of the testing process this is. Okay, so what we're seeing here is an American standard. This is an ASTM standard, and this is specific to the jaw guard of the helmet. Earlier on, we saw the line, the geometry line around the helmet for providing the test as a bicycle helmet. That is north of that line. You noted, and I said that there was nothing below that that was mandatory. If your helmet is to be downhill certified, it has a jaw guard on it, this is what has to happen. Now, this is a deflection test. Unlike the impact test where the helmet is dropped on a solid object with a weight in it, i.e. The, the human skull weight, the helmet is not. The helmet is mounted permanently here and they have a big weight that drops on that. Now typically you'll have a high speed camera exactly where the camera is right now. We've had to remove that so we can actually shoot this ourselves. And essentially what they're looking for is the amount it deflects. Obviously if it breaks it's going to fail but there's good deflection here. The whole point of a helmet is to absorb impact. If a helmet was just rigid and it bounced off things, 
you think of the damage it's going to do to the rest of your body, it has to basically slow down that G-force and absorb the impact that has been transmitted to your brain on the inside. That is where all the damage can occur to you. So check this out. Well, there you go. That's what goes into making a very light and strong and protective helmet. Uh, of course, all helmets with a safety standard have to go through the same process. So that's a very reassuring thing. And I can tell you from seeing it in the flesh, uh, the noise is quite shocking. When you hear and when you feel the weights that they're luzzing at those helmets flat out, you would not want your head to be anywhere near them. So yeah, it's a very reassuring thing. It's definitely made me think a bit more because I'm definitely an open face helmet fan. It's made me reconsider a few things. Uh, what do you guys think? Would you rather wear a open face helmet? Do you prefer the way that it feels or uh, do you not want to take any chances and run a full face? Uh, I'd love to hear what you think. Let us know in those comments and hit us up on Instagram and all the usual things. See you later.